started. So today we're going to be continuing with uh, inference or Bayesian networks. But before we get started with the main material, um, we like to have you know just a bit of our usual chit chat. Um, and the the thing that I wanted to talk about actually, I think this is quite cool because a couple of office hours ago or something like this, uh, well we've had our ethics lecture. We've been talking about ethics. Um, we were talking about how you know it just seems like such a huge responsibility for an engineer to have to think about these really tough questions. You know, when you're coding up an algorithm, is it going to be fair? Um, and hugely, uh, hugely important, huge responsibility. Yeah, it's, 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 it's very important and it's also, you know, how, how do you do this, right? Well, um, I was reading this article um, and, you know, we've heard about AI statisticians, AI yeah. um, clinicians, um, this AI ethicist, which is basically um, a regularizer that you can put into your machine learning models to help you with, um, you know, determining, you know, so, so it takes a responsibility off of the engineers, which is, I think, super helpful. Wow. Okay. I, I, I that, that's, that's interesting. How, how exactly would that work? Yeah. So, okay. So this is a part that I think is super cool. Um, so they really took a global perspective on this. Um, so they ingested a bunch of data and we know now that language models can take in, you know, these vast data sets. So they took in basically legal code data all around the world, all throughout history. So things from like, you know, take, take like Hammurabi, take like, you know, 10 commandments, that sort of stuff, you know, all the way up through, you know, declaration of rights of man, um, going, you know, Magna Carta, all of these sorts of legal documents, but also these dissenting documents, you know, um, uh, things like uh, writings by uh, MLK or Malcolm X. And, you know, all of these help form the, the space of, you know, the, the, the sorts of ethics you might want to think of in a societal context. Okay. And then we embed into that space the specific problem at hand. Um, for example, a uh, hiring decision type uh, sort of thing. And uh, by, by embedding these into the same space, we can get for particular contexts, right? So this is the thing I think is just so amazing, right? Because ethics is so society dependent, right? Um, that you, you have to map it to the to the right um, this right is, region, right location. This seems like it's come out of nowhere. This seems very surprising to me. I, I, really? I mean, the documents think, are available, right? Like, I mean, you think we you, can use natural language though to really understand ethics correctly like that? Well, it, it's picking up the. Uh, you know, patterns that have been used throughout history, right? So it, it's, uh, you know, and like the EU, you know, has documents um, for, for lots of different countries with, you know, variants and, and all of this. Like, maybe I can give you some examples of the sorts of things that we can do. Okay. Um, so, so imagining like hiring algorithms, right? And we want those hiring algorithms to be fair, right? Or, or somehow appropriate. Sure. Right. Um, so, uh, but the historical context or the, the societal context matters a ton. For these algorithms, right? Um, like what's important in one place might not be important in another place. So if you have the historical context for uh, something like, uh, you know, Liverpool in the 1800s. Oh, did I freeze? Oh no. Oh, I'm not frozen. David, are you frozen? Yeah, just David is. Just David is frozen. Okay. Oh no. Okay. <laughs> no, I, I'm 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 back. You won't believe what happens. Okay. You won't like you seriously won't believe what happens. Okay. Your 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 AI ethicist led my power to be shut off in my house. <laughs> oh dear. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible. Okay, so I, I I think I I think you didn't miss too much, <laughs> um, but I was talking about like hiring algorithms, and so if you're thinking about like child labor, you know Liverpool 1800s, like the mills, and of course you want those kids to go to school. Um, but if you want an algorithm for, um, you know present day, you know Kabul, Af Afghanistan, or something, maybe you want those like teenage women to be able to get jobs and uh, and be independent. Uh, so I, I just I think it's just a really fascinating um, 
uh, opportunity, right? Like, I mean, we have embedded ethics and it's like, you know, work for, for you all, the students, it's work for the grad students. Um, we don't need it anymore. Okay. Spotlight yourself, David. I, 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 which I have no way to do because I'm on my phone now. Oh, um, okay. <laughs> but, but for now, I mean, you, 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 can't, you can't seriously be saying that, that, that we've solved this ethical problem in AI by regularization. I mean, I, I, I believe in the power of optimization, but I'm not going to go talk to Professor Simmons or Professor Gross about this. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, you know, I, I, I sense a little bit of incredulity. What, what, what's making you suspicious? Um, I don't know. Like, wait a minute. My power just went off. <laughs> I, and, I and promise that that was not the AI ethicist. <laughs> wait a minute. Isn't it April 1 today? Hmm. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Guilty is charged. Um, April 1. <laughs> there is no AI ethicist. Um, we... You all still have to think, you have to still use your brains um, when you're using your algorithms. Um, but, but I do think, you know, you were, you were making some really good points and there's a lot of crazy stuff that gets proposed out there, right? Um, and, and uh, you know, is someone saying that, ah, oh, yes, we're gonna create this large data set of all, you know, legal decisions and legal documents throughout history and, um, you know, revolutionary canon and stuff like this. That's, that's, that's possible, right? Like someone might do that. Um, but, but it seems very um, unlikely that it would actually you know, be able to solve this very thorny well, human ethical question, right? Not to mention the norms that maybe we find appropriate in the past, maybe we don't find appropriate today as well. Right, and, and those norms were written by the people in power. Who um, tended to be white men. Um, so, uh, so yeah, ho hopefully people uh, enjoyed a bit of that. It's important to have fun, um, even if we're home during a- uh, I just as well that stop me leading class today. I'm gonna try to get my laptop tethered to my phone, but- <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, good luck with that. Um, I'm gonna um, uh, switch over to our, our main technical topic. And I saw at least one student was taking notes as well. So Richard, maybe <laughs> you should share your notes out with the class. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, so on, on to the serious business um, that we've got on today. Um, so we've got, a, our topic is the inference in Bayesian networks. And a couple notes that I just wanna say is that uh, first of all, homework five is due tomorrow, um, practical partnerships as well. Um, also, uh, we realized a, a goof in our uh, uh, section notes planning. So. The section notes that have all this wonderful stuff about um, Bayesian networks that could be useful for your current problem um, are we're going to be for next Monday. Uh, but we have we have section notes available, and there's also an ed post that David put up on deseparation. Um, so if you have more questions about that, please look it up. Um, we, you know, there's some more resources in the ed post. We also point to Bishop, which has a description um, of these things. Um, and what I'd like to do also is, uh, before going into inference in Bayesian networks, just do a really quick recap with a clarification of where we were last time. Um, so last time we were talking about Bayesian networks. So these were networks that, you know, looked something like, you know, A, uh, B, C, et cetera, D out here. Um, and the key idea was that before this point in class, you know, we just said X was a vector and we said P of X, right? And we made it into a Gaussian or we said each element is an independent coin flip. And now that vector, the, the probability in that vector can have structure, you know, element A comes from some distribution affects um, how B and D are sampled, affects how C are sampled, et cetera. So a Bayesian network can encode the, the structure, which, and specifically by structure, we mean independence and conditional independence relationships, like of a joint distribution, right? Um, so that's the that's the valuable thing about Bayesian networks. And then what we did um, is we talked about this key idea, um, which is deseparation. Um, 
And deseparation helps us understand um, what are exactly those independence and conditional independence relationships. And so we looked at cases um, where there was something in between, whether it was this way or that way. Um, we looked at situations where um, uh, the intermediate variable C um, was causing, uh, or not causing, but um, the parent of A and C. So these are all cases where observing C blocks the path, right? Um, and then the last case that I talked about was a case that looked kind of funny. It looked like this. Um, and I said, in this case, not observing C preserves independence. And the thing that I just want to add to that is that we also need to not observe any descendants of C. So for example, if we had something that looks like this, then it, I think this is fairly intuitive, but I want to make sure that it's really clear um, and that we're precise. So if you see this variable D down here, um, uh, then uh, that gives you information about C. And now that information about C can correlate um, A and B. Right, so um, there's just a little addendum here that um, I just wanted to, to point out. All right, so now um, that was last time, right? We, we talked about the structure of these networks. Um, so this time we're gonna go into inference um, in these Bayesian networks. Um, and so the, the question, the sort of question that we're going to be looking at is that suppose that I have a network so A and B are parents of C, um, you know, are parents of, of D. Um, so this all, uh, this, is, this is all our structure. And now I want to, and uh, let's make this a discrete network. So each um, node can take K values. And now what I want to do is I want to compute a marginal probability. So I want to know what is the probability of, for example, just D, right? Um, and, and this is quite reasonable. It's like saying if this is a, a vector with four elements, I just want to know what is the, the overall probability of the, the last element in that vector, the, the thing that, that's at, at position D. Okay, so how do I do this? Well, there's some basic rules of probability that I can apply. I can take the joint distribution and I can sum out um, A, B, and C, right? So there's some, some, this is always true, right? This is so far, I have not invoked anything about the structure um, of the network. And then I can actually invoke the structure of the network. So I can say, yes, it's the sum over A, B, C, and D. Uh, sorry, A, B, and C to, to get the final thing over, um, uh, over D. And here's the factorization, the associated factorization. Um, so, so far I can plug this in, right? Um, but what has it really bought me, right? Well, if I do the naive calculation over here, um, well, there's, there's K to the four elements in this probability, right? There's for every value, for every A, B, C, and D, there's K different values, right? So that's what I said up here. Every node can take on K different values. Um, and so this probability table here um, is gonna have K to the fourth values in it. And to, as I do the sum, I'm going to pretty much, I'm going to have to touch those K to the fourth values. And I'm going to have to go through each particular setting of those, right? So I, as I do the summation, you know, for particular D, well, okay, so a D is going to be a slice in the table. And if I want for every single D, I'm going to have to go through um, all the K to the fourth different values. Right. So that's going to be the, the thing that's going to be kind of, that, that's annoying, right? Like if I, I, I really, I wanted something simple. I wanted something that was like probability um, P of D, um, but it looks like it's going to take me a lot of work 
Um, and as I look at this factorization, I still have to plug in all these, I still have to loop over the K values of A, the K values of B, K values of C. Um, so today what we're gonna be talking about, um, there's two goals. Um, the first goal is just to understand this marginalization process or the process of answering questions like what is P of D? Um, and the second goal is going to be, can we try to compute this um, efficiently? So let me just write those out explicitly. So our goals, one is like how to compute um, queries you know, like the above. Um, and the second one is going to be how to do this, how to compute these, these efficiently. Right. And so you see a baby example of this here, where, like I said, to compute probability of D is that's our query. You have to sum out all the other variables. And then how, do, how much computation does it take? Well, there's these K to the fourth values if we want, uh, you know, for all or for each, uh, for each little K. Okay. So let's, um, let's deal with the first goal first. Um, so let's do a simple example uh, with queries. And this is like the classic example um, that gets used all the time. Uh, but we're going to do it because, you know, it's a classic. It's a simple, it works. It's a nice little example. Um, so in this case, one node is rain. The other node is sprinkler. And then the last one is going to be um, whether the grass is wet. Um, so here is the, the network, and uh, we're going to call these variables R, S, and W. And with these uh, three variables, um, we have P of S um, equals 1 half. Um, P of R equals 1 fourth, right? So pretty rainy times, but you know, rains one in four days. Uh, you know, sprinklers are on you know, independent coin flips here. Um, and then the probability of the grass being wet, um, given S and R, is given by the following table. And I'm, I'm writing out this table just so we can get used to this sort of way of thinking about stuff. So now we have P of W given. So if it turns out that the sprinklers are on and, they're, and it's a rainy day, then let's say 99% uh, chance that we observe that the grass is wet. You know, maybe our measurement has some error, or maybe you know, somehow it misses some blades of grass, whatever. Um, if only one of these are, are happening, um, then nine out of 10 chance that uh, we observe that the grass is, is wet, right? There's not as much coverage, right? The sprinkler misses some areas, the rain misses some sheltered areas, whatever, make up the story, but this is our, this is our probability. Um, and then if it's neither raining nor the sprinklers are on, then there's a 0% probability that we're gonna observe the, the lawn being wet. So this is, this together, these three things um, uh, over here, define the joint probability distribution for this little tiny example. So now we can do things um, just using rules of probabilities. Um, so let's consider the probability, the, the probability that it's raining um, given that I observe that the grass is wet. So how do we compute this? Well, we just need to expand things out using our Bayes rule or our just overall probability um, arithmetic. So this, this is going to come out to be the probability, uh, the joint probability over the, the total Right. So this is just expanding out based off of rules of probability. We still don't know quite how to compute this, right? Um, because our, our tables are in terms of these three variables. And, and here we have just um, two variables. So we need to expand because there's an implicit marginalization um, over the sprinkler status, right? So 
um, this top probability, if we include the, the sprinkler status, it's the probability that it's raining, um, that it's wet, and the sprinkler was on, plus the probability that it's raining, the grass is wet, uh, and the sprinkler was off, right? Because those two cases together create the case that it's raining and the, the grass was wet. And then the bottom, we're going to be doing the same thing. It's going to have many more pieces or two, twice as many pieces. I'll write them out just to be complete. This first term is the same as the one above, but now we also need to consider the case where r is equal to zero. Oops, um, that's supposed to be probability. Just waiting for me to screw that up. Okay. Um, again. Okay. Right, so we've just, uh, now we have things in terms that we know how to compute based on our probability tables. So the last thing we have to do is we just plug in. Um, so what is the probability that R equals one, uh, W equals one, S equals one? Well, the probability that R equals one is given by uh, uh, one fourth up here. Probability that S equals one is given by one half. And then the probability that wet is equal to one given R and S are equal to one is just 99 over 100. Right. Um, and then we do the same thing for this one over here. So now we have R equals one, that's one fourth. Um, S equals zero, so that's still one half. One, one, half minus, one minus one half is one half. Um, and then the grass is wet. Only one of these is on, so we're in the nine tenth category over here. Right. And I'm doing this all out just so we can see it happen once. We're not going to labor over this like multiple, multiple times, but I think it's it's useful for, for folks to, to at least see once. Um, and then the, the bottom is going to be, you know, the same sort of thing. So let me just copy over the two pieces that we already had from the top. Um, and then these two last cases, we have the rain is equal to zero, so three quarters. Um, sprinkler is on, one half, only one of these is on, um, so that gives us a nine tenths. Um, and then the last one here, we have our three quarters, we have our one half. Um, when both of these are zero, the probability of seeing uh, the grass being wet is zero, right? And if I do all this out, we get something uh, that is approximately uh, 0.4. Okay, um, so uh, that's uh, the probability that it was raining, given that I observed that the, the grass is wet. Okay. Now let's compare that to the original probability that it was raining. So if I if not, I observed nothing, then the probability that it was raining was one fourth or 0.25, right? Um, and now, given that I observed that the grass is wet, this is the computation that gives me an updated probability on how likely I think that it has rained. And so my probability has increased from 0.25 to around 0.4. Okay. Um, so that, um, and that, that, that is, that's a, just in a nutshell, just like a, why you would care about this, right? Like think about like getting a medical test or something like this. There's some baseline probability of a disease. Um, now you get like a blood draw, you get a reading from the blood draw you get an updated probability of whether you think, uh, you know, how likely you think that the, the disease is present, right? So that, that's the basics of how to do the computation. Um, now I want to um, add in one more, uh, one more piece here, which is, so this was like query one. Uh, let's do another query, um, which is the probability that it's raining. And now I'm gonna collect a little more data. I've collected information on whether the grass is wet. Um, and now I'm gonna collect information on whether the sprinkler is on. And I, and I happen to know actually that the sprinkler is on on this particular day. Um, so how would I write this out? So now I have the probability, the joint probability of like R equals one, W equals one, S equals one. And I need to appropriately normalize. I have the R equals one, W equals one, S equals one, uh, plus P of R equals zero. 
w equals one, s equals one. And uh, these are easy enough to read off. And um, what you end up with, I'm not gonna go through all the, the arithmetic for this one, is that you get 11 over 41, which is approximately 0.25, right? Close to 0.25, a little bit higher, but um, close to the prior. So this is kind of interesting as well. So this is called the uh, explaining away effect, um, where uh, initially, if I didn't measure anything about the sprinklers, then when I see the grass is wet, my thought on whether uh, the whether it has rained goes up, right? Because I'm like, well, the, the, there must have been some. I don't know why the grass is wet, but uh, it could have been the rain, could have been the sprinklers. Um, but if I observe the grass is wet, then then my overall odds of something happening have gone up, and in particular, uh, the probability of it raining went from around you know my prior probability 0.25 to 0.4. Uh, but now I observe the sprinklers. And I have a reason for why the grass is wet. It's because the sprinklers were on, right? Um, and so because I have that alternate explanation, um, suddenly the information that the grass is wet isn't telling me that much about the rain anymore. Okay. Intuitively, what's happened is um, uh, I, I'm like, uh, first I look at the grass. I'm like, oh, the grass is wet. Um, I, wonder, I wonder why. Maybe it was the rain. Um, and then someone's like, oh, well, I had the sprinklers on all day. Um, and then I'm like, well, okay. So then the grass, like being wet, there's nothing much that it's telling me. I know that the grass is going to be wet because the sprinklers were on. And so uh, my probability of it, you know, of it also having rain basically goes back to its prior because there's uh, no information being, or very little information being provided now by the fact that the grass is wet. Um, so I'm pointing this out because I think it's kind of useful to understand this kind of how adding information can sometimes you know, decrease the probability of something and sometimes it can increase the probability and hopefully it makes some intuitive sense that if you provide an alternate explanation um, for some piece of evidence, then that evidence is no longer um, you know, helping provide evidence for this other thing as well. All right. So this, this is just, uh, you know, we went through like a really careful walkthrough um, for uh, this particular example. Um, so this was basically our, our goal one, right? Like how to go about, uh, if I give you queries that look like this, you know, like I've got some evidence. So usually this is called the evidence. Um, this is called the query. If I give you some queries and some evidence, how do you go about doing the computation, right? And this is a really, it's just rules of probability. Um, it can get a little tedious, but it's just rules of probability. So the next part is how to do this efficiently, because this was the small example and already it got a little messy, right? In terms of writing out all the terms. So the next part is like, how can we compute these queries efficiently. So this was like our goal number two for this class. Maybe I should write here. Um, this is related to goal number one, how to do this computation. OK, so let's go back. So let's return to our slightly more complicated example, the one that looked like this. And recall that I had written out um, that the probability of D is equal to this joint sum over all of these three other variables, probability of A, probability of B, probability of C given A, B, probability of D given C. Um, so here we have this, uh, we, we've, we've used the structure or we've uh, put the structure of the network into um, our, our, our joint probability distribution. So this whole thing, remember, is probability of A, B, C, D. 
but so far it has not helped us, right? There's nothing useful that we've done. We still have to do the summation over all the variables over all these terms. But as we look at this, um, we, we might notice that not every term here depends on every variable, every node. And so maybe there's a clever order in which we can do these summations that's going to reduce some of the work that we have to do. Um, so in particular, if we, if we look at this, um, imagine that we take the sum over C and we decide to do that one last. So we're going to put it on the outside and put this probability of D given C out here. Um, then I'm going to do the sum over uh, B. So let me just write it out. Um, and then let me talk about it. All right. So I'm allowed to do this because the 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 product I can you know rearrange the order of the product any way I want. And then once I rearrange the order of the product, I can observe that certain terms don't depend on certain variables. So um, there's only two terms that have an A in them. So I can push those two terms together and take care of that sum. And then um, there's an, one additional term that has a B in it. Um, and then I, I have the final term with C. So why would this be beneficial, right? So let's do a little bit of thinking about what, what's happening if I rearrange things this way um, and I get this particular, um, uh, and, I, and I sum them in this particular order. So, what I have over here, what's this going to be? So this thing um, is of size k cubed, right? Um, and when we sum out the a, right? Because this, this thing is going to have a value. It's going to have a probability for every of the k values of c, every condition on every of the k values of a, and the k values of b, so k cubed. Um, we're going to sum out the a over here, right? Um, so this thing over here is going to be something of size k squared, and it's going to be a function, some function of c and b. Because c and b are the things that are going to be left over after I do this particular um, summation of a. So now we have something of size k squared. This thing over here is of size k. Um, and we're going to be summing out, let me go on to maybe a new color. Um, let's see how this, how this goes. Okay, this is K. Um, so this part over here um, is going to be summing out things. Um, it, we have something that was initially a function of C and B. Um, we're gonna be summing out the B um, with this additional little product here. Um, and we're going to get something of size k that's a function of c, right? The thing that I finished summing out over here is only going to be a function of c. And then finally, um, this bit over here is going to be a size k squared, right? Because it, for every value of d, there's k values. And for every value of c, there are k values. Um, so this is this table over here has like k squared elements in it. Um, and we're, we're, we're multiplying um, with something that's of size k, that's a function of c, and, uh, and summing out the c. So this thing over here is going to give us something of size k, um, and that's going to be like a function of d. And in fact, it's going to be the marginal that we're looking for over here. So by doing this process, um, the important thing to note um, is that our biggest factor was size k cubed, right, over here. Um, and uh, we did not need to deal with the k to the fourth uh, full tensor of joint probabilities. So there were there, there's all these multiplications going on, right? Um, there's like a k and a k squared and a and a k and a k, etc. Um, 
but all of these, like in terms of like order of size, right? Everything stays k cubed or, or less in terms of the, 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 the computations, the memory, the things that need to be touched. Um, so that's a, um, that's like an important, like it, this is a small example. So it's like a, maybe a small benefit, right? But still it's an order of magnitude, right? It's from k, k to the fourth to k cubed. Um, and the reason we were able to do this is that we noticed that, you know, to get to D, uh, if we want the marginal on D, then effectively what we're doing is we're computing the marginal on C along the way. And we're realizing that, hey, the structure of uh, this particular probability distribution tells us that we can kind of take care of A and B, find out what's the effect of A and B on the distribution on C. Um, and once we have the distribution on C, we can find the distribution on D. So, um, so the ordering matters. Like, um, so note, um, another note is that if we tried to, you know, sum out C first, um, this wouldn't have, have helped. So let's just write that out just to know, see, make explicit, you know, how this particular choice that we made was actually like a good choice. Um, so if we had tried to sum out C first, um, then what we could have done out here is that we could have had a sum over A, P of A, um, a sum over B, P of B, um, and then we need to have a sum over C, P of D given C, P of C given A and B, right? Um, and so uh, what we see here is that we basically ha have to compute this thing is a K to the fourth thing, right? Because there's values for every single value of C, A and B and D. Um, And so that doesn't really help us, right? Like, so if we made the choice of saying, let, let's sum out the C first, um, then we would end up with something that's a size K to the fourth. We end up summing out the C. So we end up with something of size K cubed. And then we end up summing out the B size K squared, um, end up summing out the A, right? Um, at each one of those stages. But we had to create this large thing first, this K to the fourth object. Um, whereas if we summed it in the different order, if we summed it more intelligently, we only ended up with objects of size k cubed rather than k to the fourth. So is there a general strategy, right? Um, so overall, you know, finding the optimal ordering uh, is hard, uh, like hard in the like NP hard. Um, sort of way, right? Um, so, so this is this is not easy to find the optimal ordering, um, but for some cases, um, there exists, you know, a strategy uh, to do this, and specifically, uh, we're going to talk today about a class of Bayesian networks that are called poly trees. So what do I mean by poly trees? So what do I mean by that is that there's no loops. Um, uh, in the in the structure. So we're going to have something that looks like maybe a and B, um, go into C, uh, go into D, and maybe there's like an E out here. Um, we could have like an F out here, um, but there's no loops. So if I add it in, so this is a poly tree. If I added in a, a, a connection like this, this creates loop um, and this would no longer uh, be a poly tree. 
Um, so there's a question about, is this the same as a DAG? So a DAG has no cycles. It was a slightly different concept. So if I created, a, so actually, okay, let's choose a different color. So if I had an edge this way, this creates a cycle. It would not be a DAG. Um, but the, the green that I drew, it's still acyclic. Right, there's just two ways to reach, two ways information about B is reaching F. So like, if you're thinking about difficulty, the reason like intuitively or conceptually why something uh, it gets, is simple in a poly tree is that there, the information about one variable reaches another variable in only one way. Whereas if I had the green arrow, there's two ways for information about B to reach F, right? So if I, the green arrow existed, there's two ways for information about B to reach F. Whereas with the pulley tree where you have none of these, um, uh, these loops, even in the directed graph, um, that means that there's only one way for information about A, for example, to reach D and it's via C. And that's gonna be the thing that helps us determine like an efficient ordering to take care of our inference. So in the case, yeah, so four poly trees. Um, to do inference. Um, the idea is relatively straightforward. Um, the first thing that we do is we prune any uh, variables um, that are not ancestors of the queried variable. Um, or the evidence. Variables. Um, and what do I mean by that? I mean that if we have something like A, B, C, and I want to know the probability of B given that A is equal to one, um, that is uh, proportional to um, the probability, the sum over C, the probability B, A equals one C, right? Always can, can sum out the joint. Um, and then uh, that's gonna be equal to sum over C probability of B given A equals one, probability of C given B, um, I can bring in the summation. And this is just one, right? So if you have this descendant variable, so this is a descendant of query. Oh. Um, yeah, so if you have a descendant of the query variable um, and the evidence, it's not going to be and or the evidence here, like it, it could have been out here as well, like something out here. Um, these are not going to make a difference, so we can prune them out. Let me just write that down as like, okay, I'm going to leave this D here. Actually, I'm just going to say that this was a descendant of the query. It's a, not an ancestor of the query or the evidence. All right, so that's one thing we can do. So we can simplify our problem in that way. Um, and then the other thing that we do, the next step is we find leaves away from the query. So our query becomes like our root and work backwards. For the query variable. Um, uh, so what is the, the question is what's the evidence variable? So let me just, yeah, let me just write that again. So 
the evidence is considered anything that you're conditioning on. So this is the what you condition on. So like my evidence is that I have seen that the grass is wet, you know, for example. Um, and then I am querying, um, my query is the variable that I want the information about in this case. So in this picture, um, A is the evidence variable, B is a query variable, and C and D are additional variables, which depending on the structure of the graph may be relevant, may be irrelevant. In this picture, I particularly, I specifically drew them to be irrelevant. Okay, um, so suppose, let me draw another picture over here um, so we can think about this in terms of structure. Um, and just see these as examples. So now suppose that we're interested in um, probability of E given that D is equal to one. Again, here's the evidence that something that we've observed. And now we want to know how that particular observation affects what we think about a specific other variable like the query. Well, um, what do we need to do here? Or what can we do here? Um, so the first thing we can do is we can ignore F. We can ignore um, F because uh, it's not an ancestor of E or D, right? So we don't need to, to that's not gonna provide any information. It's not gonna affect anything. Um, and then uh, for the remaining variables, well, the idea is that we want to start again um, away from the query and work our way in. So um, the ordering for, for something like A, B, um, and C, um, uh, so this would be a fine ordering. Um, B, A, C would also be a fine ordering. Um, the thing that we don't want to do is we don't want to put like C before A or B because A and B are, are further away from E. So we're going to work, basically, we're going to find the leaves. If we imagine a tree that's rooted at E, um, then we're going to find the things that are furthest away and work our way inward. Um, and when things meet at a branch, then they have to meet at a branch at the same time. So um, let us work this particular example out in a little more detail or just see, see how, this, how this pans out. So here's probability of E given D equals one. Um, we're gonna have the sum over A, B, and C. Uh, probability of A, probability um, of B given that D is equal to one right, because D is fixed at its particular value. Probability of C um, given A and B, probability um, of E uh, given C. Um, and then we can move in various summations, right, or move around um, various summations. So we're gonna do C last. Um, we're gonna do, let's suppose that we do A next, or next to last, sorry. Um, and then we put the last, we, we do, we start with, um, we start with B, which means we put it at the innermost or kind of write it last. Okay. Um, so this is going to have this, uh, this K squared factor or K cubed, which becomes a K squared factor. We're going to eliminate B, we're going to eliminate A, and then we're going to eliminate C. Um, so this is the ordering B, A, C over here. Let's do one more example. Um, and then what I, what I want to do is I have a, a longer concept check than usual, because I think some of this stuff, it, I think on one hand, it's just super intuitive. Like it just feels very intuitive when someone tells it to you. And then I feel like when you start writing it out, it gets a little messy. Um, so we're going to do one more example, and then we're going to do a bit of a longer concept check um, on this particular thing. So another. example. So 
in this example, um, we're going to have a structure that is a structure that we're going to look at in more detail actually next class. But for now, is like think of this as like a prelude to what's coming up. So we have A, B, C um, as a, a, you could, the, so again, as prelude, next class, we're going to be talking about a specific form of Bayesian network called a hidden Markov model. Um, and in this, we can imagine there's a, a set of variables that are evolving over time, and we get some measurements of those variables at every interval, right? So. We're, we're taking a patient's temperature at regular intervals and we want to know something about their disease progression. We're getting radar measurements um, and we want to know like location of a ship or something like this. Um, oh, there's a question. I see. Uh, there's a question about if you had an ancestor of D, um, how would you factor that in? So there we can use rules of D separation. Um, that's a really good question. So let us just, let, let me skip up and, and do this. So let's suppose that we had a G out here. Um, if our evidence tells us that D is observed in this particular case, um, then that blocks the path from G um, to E. So we, there's a, so G and E are conditionally independent given the value of D. And so we don't need to worry about ancestors. And notice that this is why that whole poly tree setup is really important because if there was, and there isn't, but I'll, I'll just draw it in a different color. If there was a, a, another way for G to sneak into C, um, then we would need to consider, we would have to sum out the, the effect of G. And this becomes a more complicated, um, so if, this edge, I'm going to just put this in text so if people are looking at the notes afterwards, if this edge existed, um, this would be a lot harder. Yeah, so let's just circle this. Yeah, so this is like, if we if we had something like this, then um, this, this problem would become a lot harder. It's not the setup that we're, that we're discussing. It's a really good question. All right. Okay, so here's one more example just to talk through. Um, so in this particular example, uh, again, imagine something that's evolving over time. Um, we have some sort of measurements and we want to know the probability um, of C given specific values of E, F, and G, right? So how, how, do, we, uh, how do we consider this? Well, um, there's a lot of pieces here, but really there's there's just a summation. The only summation that we got to do that's left over is the over A and B, right? Because these guys are all observed. Um, and these are the two additional variables that we, we, we're going to need to marginalize over. Um, and so uh, what we should do um, using the these general rules that we've talked about is we should um, start by uh, summing out the, the A and then we sum out the B right, because we start farthest away from C and work our way um, inward. So probability of C given E, F, and G um, is equal to the sum over A and B, probability of A, probability of E. Let me just put down E equals one, like just to kind of indicate that it's like absurd. We, we could, if it was a continuous value variable or whatever, it, it would be fine, same, same idea. Um, but I'm just gonna put that in so we kind of know that it, it, it's like been observed. Probability of B given A, probability of F given B, um, probability of C given B, probability of G equaling a certain value variable given C. So there's lots of pieces here, right? Um, and, and hopefully we get good at reading off these pieces also when we see one of these graphs. Um, and now what we can do is we can uh, change up some of the ordering. So the, this probability of the, this G equals one uh, given C, that doesn't depend on these summations can be brought all the way out. Then we have the part that depends on B, um, which is this probability P of F equals one given B, um, probability of C given B. And then the remaining terms all need to stay in the innermost summation. 
And what we can notice are these are k-dimensional vectors. Um, this over here is going to be a k squared. Um, so the thing that we're going to, um, and when we do the summation, we're going to pass on a, a size k factor, right? Like once we have this thing that's going to be a function of b and a, we're going to sum out the a. We're going to pass on a, a size k uh, function of b. Um, and then over here, um, this thing over here is k squared, or let me go back and do the different colors so it's easier to keep them separated. k squared, this thing is of size k. There's a k size thing over here that's coming in. Um, and we're going to sum out the b's. So we end up with passing on a size k g of c, like some function of c. And this over here, this last part, also size k. Um, so the final thing, um, we get our size k probability of c conditioned on stuff. So the cool thing is, it, and this is something that we'll talk about more in next class, is that in each of these stages, um, in this, in this particular structure, you know, things got a little bigger, k squared, and they got squeezed down to k. They got bigger, k size, k squared, and they get, get squeezed down to k again. Um, and in this particular case, or in, in overall, like these factors, when I say pass on a thing of size uh, k that I'm calling g of c or g of b, these are called the messages. This is the the message that A passes to B that incorporates things about E, the message that B passes to C incorporates things about E and F. Um, but if, if that's uh, a little much, we're going to be getting to that next class in a lot more detail. Oh, yes. Yes, there's a proportionality here. Um, cool. All right. Um, so there we have the basic ideas. What I'd like to do now um, is to switch over to uh, this concept check, which is a little more involved because we're going to go into some more detail um, in terms of causality. So uh, what I'd like to do, um, I'm going to share the, the screen of the, the concept check, and then we're going to talk a little bit about it. Um, okay, uh, but oh, good point. Okay, so if there's any questions, though, we should stop and do that. So, how do we? There's a question of like, how do we go from this k and k squared things to something that's eventually a size k? So, this is a uh, this p of a we can think of as a vector that's like size k. Um, maybe I should write this whole thing in green. Um, so, this is a little thing of size k. This thing is also a thing of size k, right? It's like a probability of e equals 1 for every single value of a, for all the k values. And this thing is the matrix um, that has like the k by k for every a and every b. So uh, when we, what we're doing here is, first of all, there's like an element-wise, what can be thought of as an element-wise multiply between this guy over here this guy over here, but this element here gets multiplied by this element here. Um, and then this, the thing, uh, this combined vector, um, gets uh, multiplied. So you can think of it as a matrix vector multiply, um, which ends us up with uh, the new vector. Um, or you can think of it as I I take this vector and I, I apply it to every column in this matrix and then I sum across, which is basically the definition of the, the multiply that we're doing. Um, either way, that, that, is, that is kind of most clear to you. I, I sometimes I think of it as the, the latter, even though, it, I mean, it's kind of simpler to say that it's just the matrix vector multiply. I think sometimes it's simpler to think about it as Okay, for for if this if this row over here represents like a is equal to a certain value, then I need to take this column. Then I need to make sure that this value over here gets multiplied by you know each element in going across this row, which is which corresponds to taking this column and multiplying it across. Any other questions? 
before I move on. Yeah. All right. So let's move into the concept check, um, which, as I said, is a bit more involved today. Here's the link and let me share. Okay, so in this concept check, we're going to look at a particularly, uh, well, one particular use um, of Bayesian networks, which is uh, thinking about causal relations. So the first, uh, so first let's just go through like the structure of this network. So the idea here is that there is some hidden variable Z um, and the hidden variable Z um, and the treatment variable T um, affect the outcome that we observe, right? So uh, given that the patient has some condition, we give them some treatment, the condition and the treatment together determine the outcome, the, what happens after treatment. And in general, there's gonna be a link between the condition and the treatment, right? Because uh, we're not gonna give a treatment if the patient's not sick, right? <laughs> um, so there's a, there's a link here. These are not um, uh, uncorrelated. They're not independent variables. The other thing that's kind of important here is that we don't know exactly what sickness the patient has. We take measurements. So we're gonna simulate that by saying that there's a hidden variable Z and there's an observed variable X which is our measurement of what we think of as our measurement of C. So I think, first of all, it's really important to just have those two pieces clarified. Um, so that's what we've got. Um, and now uh, one thing we're gonna talk about that I'm introducing in this concept check is that if we do an intervention on T, so we go in and we say, we're gonna do a randomized trial. We are going to now uh, treat uh, patients with some probability. We're just going to flip a coin. Then how does this graph change? You know, what are the, what relationships in this graph are, are, are now different? If I say that T is intervened upon externally by us, um, I'm not going to, not going to say more because I feel like saying more kind of gives away the answer. But what we, what we want you to think about is that in the original setting, the condition Z uh, affects the treatment that is chosen. Now I'm going to go in and say, I'm going to just flip a coin to decide what Z is, uh, sorry, what T is, um, and how does that affect the structure of the graph? All right. Um, so then I, the, the reasonable thing that I want to do in this particular situation is, well, I want to make an estimate of, um, you know, what is the probability of an outcome given the treatment? Right. This is a very reasonable question to ask. It can be, um, you know, if I'm going to do this intervention, if I'm going to uh, encourage everyone to stop smoking, for example, uh, that's my treatment. What will the outcomes be? And you know, it may depend on the, the setting of Z. Um, you know, for people who are not going to smoke anyway, maybe this this intervention, this public health campaign, has no difference. Um, maybe for people who are smokers, there's a proportion of people for it is a difference, right? Um, so what we'd like you to do is just think about, here's it, you can think about this as a query um, uh, that we're making and we're saying that T is being set to one. Um, again, the, the do notation here means that we're setting it to that value. Um, we're not, it, it's not, it didn't happen to be at that value, we set it to that value. Um, and, and you can also think about, you know, why is this important from like some of our like poly tree type arguments in terms of like what, what you know, th this does not have that structure, right? But if we intervene on T, um, does that change the structure in a, in a way that makes things easier? And then this last one is the most involved. Um, and if you don't get through it all, that's okay. Um, but what we'd like you to do um, is now imagine the more realistic scenario where you don't have Z available to you. You can only take measurements of the, the, the sickness um, rather than the sickness itself. Um, and what we'd like you to do is just start out trying to calculate P of X equals one, P of X equals zero, 
and some of these conditional probabilities. Um, notice that there's no do written anymore, um, just the, these conditional probabilities. Um, and then uh, answer the final question. Again, if you don't get through this whole thing, um, that's okay. Um, but what we'd like you to do is just treat this as an opportunity to think about like how to write out some of these probability tables and how to think about doing some of these conditionings. Um, and then uh, what we'll do when we reconvene is we'll, we'll go through the basic steps and we'll also talk about some of the takeaways uh, from this particular exam. You want me to open the rooms? Uh, yeah, that'd be fantastic. Okay. Sorry, I have I have no idea how to do that without sending you as well. And now I think the same thing as last time. Uh, your loudspeaker is not working, or and I don't oh, hear you. Oh, uh, okay, I hear okay. you now. That, that, without, okay, <laughs> apparently, just mutes me when I come back. Okay, so it's repeatable at least. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh my God! So I couldn't keep a straight face. First of all, um, I, I, I that was why at one point I had to turn my camera off. <laughs> <laughs> and then secondly, the power went out. I know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we've got everyone back. Um, let me go ahead and share screen again. Um, okay, so the first part of the question is, uh, you know, what happens when we do t equals one? How does the graph change? Um, and the correct answer there is that this link from z to t goes away. Because if I'm flipping a coin now to determine whether um, we go from Z to T, then, uh, sorry, whether T is on or not, then, it, then there's no, the, the effect of the disease is no longer there, right? There are some people who are getting the treatment, there's some people who are not getting the treatment. And as an aside, this is like the superpower of a randomized trial, right? That in a randomized trial, um, we can get the marginal effect of the treatment on the outcome. Um, by flipping these coins, because now we don't have to think about, well, maybe that treatment was given, is, is usually only given to sick patients. So we see bad outcomes under a treatment means that, you know, Z was already bad, you know, Z, the patients were already sick. Um, so that's the magic of, of doing a clinical trial, a randomized or a randomized control trial, I should say, um, uh, whether it's in the health setting or whether it's in some, you know, global intervention setting, whatever it is, right? Um, so, uh, so that's how the graph changes. Um, then what is the probability that y equals one, given that you uh, do this intervention? Well, the thing that we need to marginalize over the, the variable that's the ancestor um, is z, right? So we don't care about the x, but we need to, to marginalize over the z. Um, so now we have the probability that y is equal to one, given t is equal to one, um, sorry this one down here, y is equal to one, given t is equal to one, um, uh, given the different values of z, probability of z, um, because t was intervened on, t was fixed, we don't need this additional term over here, right, because we intervened on the t, so we don't need to consider the probability um, that t is equal to one, given z, so it's this third answer right here. Um, and uh, if you work out what this particular answer comes out to be, um, it's gonna come out to be 0.5 because P of Z was 0.5, T is equal to one, and the outcome is just T and Z, right? So T is always one, we intervened. Um, Z is one 50% of the time. Um, so the, the marginal is gonna come out to be the, to 0.5. All right, so that's B. Um, now in C, the key point that we want you to take away um, that at the high, well, there's, there's, the, there's two things, right? First of all, there's the exercise of writing out all of the probability tables. Um, and then the other key point that I want you all to go, take away from this is that it does not come out to be 0.5. That if you have a noisy measurement of your hidden variable and you try to pretend that it's not a noisy measurement, that it is your, your variable, um, you'll get the wrong answer. You'll get a different answer. 
So that's the kind of like causality aha uh -huh, um, that this paper that this is uh, inspired by um, comes from. So I just want to mention that aha. Uh -huh. And then um, what I'm going to do um, is I'm going to very briefly, I'm not going to go through the whole exercise, but I will tell you how I would get started on question C. So just you can check yourself depending on how far um, you got. There's also a quick clarification from Michal on what you just did. I'm sorry. That's the, isn't the probability of T equals when given. So T is given, right? So it, well, I think this is a bit of conceptual thinking of like there's a because the probability of t given z would depend on this this pt variable in the in the problem um, for for that particular case All right um so now i'm going to just very quickly share how one would approach that last piece i'm not going to work it out because there i mean we're already over time um, but the, the table that I would like people to construct is a table that looks like Z, X, um, T, Y. And you can go through and be like, what's the probability that all of these, oh, okay, yeah, it's getting a little sloppy. What's the probability of these? Um, so for example, this would be equal to 0.5 um, PX, PT. Um, from the, from just the definitions of the distributions, and then once you have um, given the joint table, um, we can compute the the marginals. In particular, there's going to be some rows here um, where where y is equal to to one that we care about. Um, so I'm not going to go through that. Um, I can answer questions like after class if, if folks want to hang around. But this is the way you would approach um, the third question: is that you would fill out this particular table, and then you could find, you know, how often, you know, what are the probabilities associated with the x equals zeros versus the x equals ones. That could give you the distributions for p of x. Um, if you need to know situations where y the outcome is equal to one. And those are going to be certain rows in the table associated with certain probabilities as well, right? So that's how you go about doing this, uh, doing this calculation. Okay. Um, so as